I was in my butchers down in Sussex at that time and uh, I said to him one day, why do people pay more for a rubber bone chicken than for a good honest pheasant? Lord Tibbet, thank you for inviting us to your glorious home to talk about your new book, The Game Cook. Um, I would say that lots of politicians have written books, but I think you're probably unique, aren't you, in having written a cookbook. Well, tell, us, tell us how you came to, came to write it. Well, I, th I think I probably am, but as the grandson of a butcher, um, I was always interested in food. Um, and didn't have any sentimentality about it, was, but about realistic about food. And then um, uh, I'd taken up shooting as a bit of a hobby. What age did you start shooting? Uh, oh, I was in my uh, 40s when I did that. And my wife um, persuaded me to do it to try and get me to think about something other than politics. I think she regretted it afterwards because I forgot to think about anything except shooting the season. But also a way of releasing tension, yes, I yes, guess. Right. <laughs> yes. um, and um, uh, so I got into shooting. That got me into the cookery of the birds and other animals that one shot. And um, I was in my butchers down in Sussex at that time. And uh, I said to him one day, why do people pay more? for a rubber bone chicken than for a good honest pheasant. And he said, I think it's because they think they couldn't cook a pheasant, they're scared of cooking it, they don't know how to. And I thought about it and said, well, I'd better tell them. People it's, always think they're going to be tough, don't they? Is, is that one of the things you find? Yes, well, think? also they, they just think it's going to be complicated and they don't realise how straightforward it is. Um, and I'd learned at my mother's knee how to do things like plucking and cleaning birds and things of that kind. And uh, in his old age, when he was long retired, my grandfather had introduced me to the delights of ferreting for rabbits. Um, not, not a thing which is practised much these days. Um, and um, so I settled down and I thought about it. And then I found an illustrator for my book, um, Debbie Mason. And Debbie uh, is a Devon girl, a quite substantial, well-known wildlife painter. And uh, she also loves food. And she convinced me that we should redefine game as anything you actually have to go and hunt or chase. Um, so hence you have fish in hence, your book. Hence isn't? we have salmon and things like that. And that all began really because when Debbie fancies scallops for tea, she gets the boat out, puts her scuba diving kit on and over the side and grabs them. Um, Doesn't come much fresher than that. <laughs> no, and, and what's more, it's much nicer these days when they're about £20 a kilo. <laughs> so you sat down together, put your heads together and, and came up with recipes that you... Yes, yes. Debbie contributed some of them, though mostly mine, um, from my mother, from my family and things of that kind. And they are, I think this is the thing about the recipes in your book, um, they are simple and straightforward, aren't they? They're, they're, you do take the fear out of tackling grouse or partridge or yes. pheasant uh, and venison as well. Yes. Um, but I think the interesting thing too about the recipes in your book is that they aren't all traditional English recipes. You've obviously got quite a broad palette for exotic taste. Now, it, did this come about with your years of being a pilot and travelling and tasting things that you would never have tasted as a child? Well, certainly, yes. Um, uh, I was uh, travelling uh, all over the world, really, except um, the Soviet Union and China. Um, and um, so you'll find recipes for curried birds. Um, the use of dal, which I love. I think it's a wonderful food and, um, and, and extremely nourishing, whether it's with a bit of spice for curry or with um, perhaps to use alongside um, uh, a pheasant. Um, so, yes, there's 
quite a bit of variety into it. And then traditional recipes like um, uh, pheasant with apples and cream, uh, faison normand, um, as the French would have it. And um, that, that, I think, is the most wonderful dish. So, um, pheasant normand, um, it sounds as though it's named after you, but obviously it's, it, it, it's the French one. Yes, I'm fascinated by your use of um, dal alongside, and your curry, because, again, that's not something that people would normally think to do with, um, I think most people think, uh, you know, put it in the oven, roast it, end of story, but you've got quite an, a number of, uh, of, of spicy curry recipes. Yes, in this. And, and using um, fruit as well. Um, one of my favourites is the partridge with um, blue cheese and pears. Uh, that's a, a delightful mixture. Where did that come from? Um, I can't remember now where I first picked that up. It's, it's a really unusual combination. Yes, it is. So I think the other unusual thing about you, surely for your generation, um, is you said that your grandfather had a, a, a butcher's shop, but that doesn't necessarily turn you into somebody who is uh, is into cooking. And, and a lot of men of your generation wouldn't have gone anywhere near a kitchen. So um, when did you sort of hone your culinary skills? Well, my mother taught me quite a bit. And... Um, uh, Again, during the war, you had to be quite ingenious in, in how you cooked and what you cooked. Uh, Did you have much gain during the war when you were in the RAF? No, 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 no. Um, but uh, uh, the poultry, which we kept in our back gardens and things of that kind. Um, and then um, uh, when I got married, um, uh, my wife was a good cook anyway. And so we enjoyed cooking food together in the kitchen and trying new things. Um, and then, of course, um, since the IRA tried to murder us, um, my wife had been very badly incapacitated. And so most of the actual cooking work, the manual stuff, using your hands, fell to me. Um, although she was still there in the kitchen making sure I got it right. You know what women are like, don't you? Um, and, uh, and so it grew on and on and on. And so um, you, obviously, the, the main cooking fell to you at that time. So uh, you say in the book um, that one of your, um, or two of your heroines, I think, are Delia Smith and Jane Grigson. How did you get into into the two of those, and why do you like their writing so much? Well, I like Jane Gregson, and, and indeed her mother, uh, who, who was a... a Sophie a, and, and Jane, yeah. Yes, yeah. who was a great cook. Um, and... Um, uh, I liked her style of writing. Um, I liked the, her recipes very much indeed. And um, as for... Um, uh, oh, <laughs> I forgot for a moment. Delia. Yes. Uh, then, then, of course, as far as Delia is concerned, I always know that if I open the book, find the recipe, stand to attention... <laughs> And follow, follow it to the letter. Instructions exactly. <laughs> it will turn out right. Um, so, but again, that's you're quite unusual in that. I, I don't think of. I mean, all right, chefs aside, we're talking because you're a home cook and not a chef. I don't tend to think of many men reading cookery books. And are, are you an avid cookbook explorer? Yes, I do. I I, I enjoy exploring cookbooks, and um, uh, I'm acutely conscious, of course, of the difference between a chef and a cook. You know the difference? Well, one's a professional kitchen well, and the other's... Uh, uh, the real difference is that a chef doesn't do his own washing up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of that. I like that. <laughs> well, and he's got everybody else to do everything for him anyway. The, the, the commie chef and the sous chef yes, and everything else. Right. Yeah, yeah, but I like that. You've got to do your own washing up. <laughs> so do you still experiment quite a lot now, Norman? Yes, I shall start experimenting again. Um, now we're into the game season. I don't do you shoot regularly still now? Yes, I still do a little bit. Not as much as I used to because um, I'm no longer as agile as I was. And um, uh, going over a ploughed field in wet weather, uh, carrying a gun and cartridges um, is beginning to get a bit onerous. Uh, in fact, my younger son, who's a good shot and a good cook, um, uh, has appointed himself to look after me now when I go shooting and to take the weight of it off my shoulders.
And, and is it mixed shooting? So would it be pheasant and uh, well, uh, mostly I, pheasant? Because I know that the book has quite a lot of pheasant recipes. Is that yes. your favourite game? I think probably, uh, yes, because it's so versatile. Um, and, uh, of course, pheasants are not really at their best until round about Christmas and into January when they're really nice and fat. They've really fed up uh, over the winter period. Um, uh, the partridge coming into season much earlier, you, after all the partridge season starts in September and the pheasant not until October. Um, so go for the partridge first and um, have a few days at that and then uh, after Christmas really, uh, January time, yes the pheasants are lovely. And what about venison? Do you, have, you, have you ever shot...? Um... No, I've, I've, I've not gone into venice uh, into deer shooting um <clears throat> my younger son is very much into it and so uh, uh christmas last year um he came here uh, with his wife and uh, they cooked um uh, venison for christmas day what what is the thing about that i think this is a, the, another thing that people don't uh, often understand about again why do we have the seasons for shooting and why why do they differ well, it's a matter of really of when the birds are breeding, first of all, to protect them, and secondly, when they are literally well fed and fattened up and really good to eat. And um, of course, again, people are inclined to be a bit sentimental and say oh, how awful it is to kill these birds. Well, my view is that if I was going to have to make the choice between being born uh, a broiler house chicken and, and a pheasant, I know which I would go for. <laughs> um, the poor chicken never seeing the light of day, never knowing fresh air, never flying, nothing like that, um, and a short life. And the pheasant, he's had a decent life. And indeed, at the end of uh, January, when the season comes to an end, uh, not all the pheasants are dead. A lot of them are surviving and they're going to have a complete year of life then. Uh, they'll fly, they'll mate, they'll see their young growing up. Um, and it's a bit more of a life, isn't it, than this poor miserable chicken. So you're very much keen on, on, on the flavour of your food and the taste of it. I mean, I agree with you, there's, there's the, the, a, a miserable life to being a, a, a battery chicken, and you can tell that miserable life, whereas game has that freshness and that quality yes. about it, because they've last, largely grazed in the wild, haven't they? Yes. But this is the difficulty too. How do we know? You were saying about those pheasants who live for another year, live to fight another day this is often the problem isn't it with knowing what the age of a bird is when you come to cook it oh yes um well you can you can feel that when you start to pluck it and when you start to clean it and um right you may find you've got a pheasant which uh, would be better casseroled um, rather than roasted. So we should really slow cook the older ones yes. and, and the younger ones are fine for just quick quick yes. cooking. And and I guess too, even if it's an old bird, if you just remove the breasts and sear that, would that be okay or would, yes, should you I'd, still I'd slow? I'd mostly still just slow, still. slow cook it. Um, and of course venison there, then that's again a different thing because uh, people are always careful to uh, choose the beasts that they bring down. And what about hanging? What, what are your, your views on letting birds hang? And Well, I think that's become a more difficult thing now because um, our friends in f elf and safety um, uh, uh, seem doubtful about the idea, the traditional idea, of um, bringing the bird back home from the chute and hanging it uh, in a cool place and this house is wonderful because I've got wonderful cellars down here um, uh, to hang them in a cool place for perhaps a week, something like that. Um, uh, that brings out the flavour of the meat much more. Um, but nowadays, uh, at a shoot, if the birds are going into the food chain, they're supposed to be put into a cooler within four hours of being shot. And I think that really takes away some of the full flavour. 
but you 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 think the old method of of hanging was good and had a reason to allow the full yes, flavour to come out. Yes, uh, of course. Sometimes you come unstuck, and you find that your dog and. Uh, really shooting his best if you've got your dog with you, um, that he's found a bird that has been missed from a week earlier. Um, and you find that uh, if you hang that one for a week, it's, it's really getting a bit beyond it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Lord Tebbit, what, which would you say in, in your book is your, is your favoured and most cooked recipe? Which is the one you go to again and again? Would, I think it would be a close run thing between the pheasant with apples and cream um, or the partridge uh, with uh, blue cheese and pears. And really it would depend on whether it was uh, September or whether it was November. One question I wanted to ask you about your cooking and your your being in the kitchen, because I think those of us who do cook, there is that that sort of pleasantness of opening a bottle of wine and having a glass and standing there and stirring a pot. Do you find um, cooking relaxing and comforting? Yes, I do. Um, it takes your mind off of all sorts of other things. And now that my wife is not only disabled, but is really quite ill, um, she doesn't spend a lot of time out of her bed and um, so about six o'clock in the evening we're beginning to gather in the kitchen uh, myself my wife um, her carers and nurses and uh, we are sort of talking as we're finishing off the cooking uh, getting the vegetables on and all things of that kind and um, usually about half past six one of the girls will say to me Norman um, isn't it time for your medication and I say oh yes and she says uh, it'll be the red tonight with the <laughs> your medication comes in a bottle <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, that's, that's when one really relaxes <laughs> the best kind yes thank you